And Ben, can you uh, authorize uh, Andres PC to record in Spanish, please? He's a, okay. Uh, okay, so the setting is, um, Grace Cathedral is in San Francisco and I sing there regularly, either for people walking the labyrinth as a meditation or for people doing yoga. And so what you're going to see right now um, is not as long as, oh, is this the right one? Hang on. No, I've put the wrong one. Hang on a second. My mistake. Let me get rid of that. Uh, here it is. Okay. So it's the Shavasana, which is the part at the end where everyone just rests. Okay. You'll hear a little bit of, of Darren talking first. Ben, what if I give you the link? Okay, let's try that. Yeah. Okay, hang on. <laughs> I'm gonna. Stop. Yo solo quiero decir que el, la incertidumbre es parte del camino de la regeneración y las cosas que pasan así es también parte de lo que tenemos que is. aprender a sortear. Así and, que. And it'll. Oh, bien. Sorry. Video unavailable. Video is private. <laughs> <laughs> Let me change that. <laughs> All right. One minute. <laughs> uh, did, did you get the recording, uh, Andres? I thought I did enable it, right? No? Okay, so the SP record. And I actually don't see that option. Where is the modem? Yeah, I, I don't. Ben, I've got a suggestion. Yeah, I know, I'm clicking them. I see chat. Oh, you have to admit, no, chat, ask to start video, pin, make host. Oh, I remove co host positions. It's, it's, Oh, there we go. There we go. Allow to record. You want local files? Yes. Okay. There we go. All right. Should we start the recording again, or should we leave this as a record of, of our? <laughs> I think it's all good. All right. Uh, so. So um, we may actually have to resort to the other one that you had first suggested. We can use the uh, the cathedral one another time. So okay. if you. If you take the second link, then that's definitely public. The second link in the chat. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is actually in my will be in my living room in San Francisco. Well, in the East Bay. <laughs> is right. it going to work? Share sound, optimize for video, share, maximize. And play. Hi, I'm Claire Hedin, and I am going to sing for you some of my sound alchemy and sound healing. Enjoy. <laughs>
So welcome to the summit. I extend a very warm welcome from your three hosts, myself, Isabel Carlyle, Melina Angel in Costa Rica, and Ben Roberts in Massachusetts. And I'm currently sitting in Woodstock in upstate New York, but I, I really live in Devon, England, and I'm heading back there soon. And we are very excited that you're here. We had a wonderful plenary this morning with John Fullerton speaking and John and Edward Muller, who's going to be speaking later in this plenary to us and Stuart Cowan together started the Regenerative Communities Network. And the three of us are part of that network. 
and have been planning this summit together with other network members for the last eight months at least. And we've um, put together a delicious program with thanks to everybody who's contributed. It's kind of a self-organizing program. Anyone who wants to pitch in a session can do that. There's still time to do that. Um, but for now, I just want to send you a very warm, warm welcome and to hand over to Melina, who's going to talk a bit about the intentions for the summit. Wait, I thought we were the ritual first, right? We're just kind of, this is the welcome, the, right? But, but, really? but do welcome us, Melina. <laughs> 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 then we're going to do the, the Thanksgiving. Sí. Well, bienvenidos, yeah. bienvenidos y bienvenidas a, a todos. Um, este es un intento muy grande también de hacer un intercambio cultural lo mejor que podamos entre el mundo que mayoritariamente habla inglés y el mundo que mayoritariamente habla español. Muchísimas gracias por conectarse, muchísimas gracias por estar y por comprender que eh, podemos conectarnos por encima de las, de las culturas y de los idiomas, estamos para, para hacer esto, espero que aprovechen todos los espacios participativos que hemos soñado juntos y vamos a, a enviar un agradecimiento profundo a, a la tierra, a los elementos y Ben nos va a, a llevar a través de este proceso. Ben. Thank you, Melina. And before I do that, um, I do want to just sort of give you a quick overview of our agenda for this plenary session. So coming up next is the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address, uh, which we'll do together as a, as a kind of ritual. Then we'll hear a bit more from Isabel and Melina about the context for this summit and our intentions for the summit. Um, then we'll have some small group conversations just briefly to, to get connect with a few people that are here, each of you. Um, then we have two speakers today that we're very excited to feature. Helena Norberg-Hodge uh, from Local Futures has recorded a video for us. And we have Edward Muller um, from Costa Rica, Guanacaste, UCI, who will be, be speaking live. And then I think we're, we're gonna go back into small groups briefly to talk a bit about what you've heard in those sessions in, in, in from those two speakers. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk a bit about how to participate in the summit and some of the practical details. But we may run a little bit over on that. And we're going to flow straight into an hour long hangout session or actually an hour plus however long people want to stay. Uh, and all of it's recorded. So if, if you need to go, if you miss anything, that's fine. Um, but uh, since we, we had some some issues, we're going to we're going to just take the time we need to do this in the way that we've intended. Uh, so with that. Thank you both Melina and Isabel. And so this is a this is a participatory process. This is something that the Haudenosaunee people, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy um, in the Northeast of the United States, uh, would say as the words before else, before all else when they gather. And, and unlike many Native American traditions, we actually have permission to use these words. I think it was in Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, that she has a conversation with an, uh, uh, an elder from one of the six tribes who says, we've been waiting 500 years for the world to take up these words and share them. Um, so we've done an adaptation of it. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, taken from uh, the website Dance for All People. And uh, we've adapted it for the plenaries. It's a little bit longer traditionally in terms of the number of things that are thanked, the number of entities um, than what we're doing here. Um, but here's how it's gonna work. Um, I'm gonna invite, uh, each, each time we, we speak, there's, there's some words. I'll show you the first ones here. Um, and we'll do this, I think, seven times. And um, I'll just invite somebody to come off mute and read. And then when they finished together, we all come off mute and say, now our minds are one and then mute ourselves again. And then I'll go to the next slide and someone else will step in and take a turn. The last time you'll see it says pause. And so we'll just sit for a little bit and then go to the final, the final slide of now our minds are one. So I'm going to invite whoever wishes to now to, uh, to step up on off the mic or on the mic rather and uh, 
and speak to us. We are all thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk about upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send our greetings and our thanks. Now, now our minds are one. Are one. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms. Waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the spirit of water. Now our now minds are, are one. one. Are one. Now we turn toward nature. Now we turn toward nature. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain many life forms and offer us food and medicine. Animals have many things to teach and to give us as people. We are glad that they're still here and we pray that this will always be so. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to all of nature. Now, now all our, our minds, minds are, are one. 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 We now send our greetings and our thanks for Father the Son. Each day without fail, he travels the sky from east to west, bringing the light of a new day. He is the source of all the fires of life. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to Father, the Son. Now, now our, our minds, minds are, are, are one. one. Now we turn ourselves to the Great Spirit and send our greetings and our thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this Mother Earth. For all the love that is around us, we gather our beings together as one and send our choicest words of greeting and thanks to the Great Spirit. Now, now, now our, our minds are one. one. Are one. Well, well, well. We have now arrived at the place where we end our words. Of all the things we have named, it is not our intention to leave anything out. If something has been forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send their greetings and their thanks in their own way. Now, now our, our, minds, minds, our minds are, are one. one. Thank you, everyone. Oh, that's what's going on. I had the spotlight on. That's why I wasn't seeing other people. <laughs> but we heard the voices. I want to say one more thing. You know, it, it's very common in what's sometimes known as Turtle Island 
here in North America um, to give a land acknowledgement to the to the the original occupants of the land who are all, who are still here, but but um, uh, to say that this is their land that is now occupied. But because we are coming from many different places, there's a different kind of acknowledgement that I want to name, which is the places and the and the people in those places where all of the materials that support our virtual capacities to gather come from all the rare earth minerals all of the oil and the coal and the gas that provides the electricity that's driving these devices the metals everything else there's a terrible cost often to the sourcing of these things and i want to invite us to just recognize that price and our indebtedness and and share a moment of of thanks and recognition for the sacrifices that people and our mother earth have made to allow us to gather in this way. So I want to bring back Isabel and Melina to talk a bit about the context and the intentions. Thank you, Ben. So I'm going to say a little bit about what we're doing here in the biggest context. And as we know, this is a time of um, instability, even perhaps chaos as we have geosystems on the move, huge um, systems like the Atlantic or the Arctic ice caps and the Antarctic ice caps, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, also known as the Gulf Stream, um, the, the jet stream, these are all huge geosystems that due to global heating are becoming destabilized. So we're living at a time when we have systems on the move. You could say Gaia's on the move. And in many ways, what we're doing with um, bioregions is to figure out a generative response to that. How do we organize? And of course, bioregions are not a new idea or a new way of being on the earth. They have um, been a way of inhabiting place from the very beginning. From the very beginning means uh, at least 500,000 years ago, if not more certainly going back to Neanderthal people and then early Homo sapiens. So if we take a kind of deep time look at bioregions, we can see how, how early people organize themselves according to watersheds, according to water, according to soil and to the kind of trees they had in their territory and the kind of instruments they could make from those trees and from the stone and so on. And in some ways, this kind of is in our DNA, this way of organizing. But if we also take a, um, a very deep time perspective, we can say that our understanding of bioregions is formed by a kind of coherence. It's a coherence between geology from very deep time, geography, landforms, the fauna, the flora, the, uh, the rainfall patterns, but also human culture. So if we layer all these things up, we um, have a sense of where the edges of our bioregion are. And people talk about creating islands of coherence. That's what um, bioregional work does. So this response that we are all experimenting with in so many different ways, we're all bringing a different part of the jigsaw puzzle of bioregioning to the table during the summit. We all have different experiences. Um, for myself, I really want to acknowledge and uh, the debt of gratitude that I and others have to the early um, pioneers of bioregioning in the both in the 20th and 21st century. In the 20th century, I'm thinking particularly of Kirkpatrick Sale and Peter Berg in um, Northwest United States, and certainly personally, Danella Meadows and her work around bioregions and the paper that she wrote in 1980 about bioregional learning centers and the work of Eleanor Ostrom about the commons and common pool resources because many of us working at bioregional scale are thinking about the global commons and how do we steward the global commons, things like biodiversity, 
locally. And I also want to just say and to note that all this bioregional work is relational, that we can be doing all sorts of projects on the ground. We can be um, doing regenerative agriculture or thinking about regenerative funding for our work. But fundamentally, we're building relationships. And that's why we've chosen the metaphor of mycelium as the, um, as the guiding metaphor for this summit. And the challenge to all of us is to inhabit mycelium. The metaphor is, comes from the ancient Greek. It literally means a crossing over. If you can inhabit a metaphor, it changes you and it changes the world around you. And on that note of relationality and the great theme of our summit, which is radical connection and collaboration, I'm going to hand over to Melina. Gracias, Isabel. Um, sí, nuestra conexión realmente aquí es lo que estamos haciendo en todo esto, es recordar que somos naturaleza. Y, y ser naturaleza, pues, nos, nos hace encontrarnos en la regeneración bioregional, porque el concepto de regeneración pone la vida en el centro, la regeneración es un proceso biológico. Y también estamos de acuerdo, viniendo acá, en que la bioregión es la escala a la cual tenemos que actuar. Pero además de eso, esa resonancia que todos estamos sintiendo esa, es por la colaboración, la colaboración radical y radical en el sentido de raíz, porque nos enraiza, nos conecta al territorio, pero también en el sentido de, de claridad, de tener una claridad de cómo tenemos que hacer las cosas. Entonces hemos creado en esta cumbre un espacio participativo donde abramos los flujos de información, donde abramos la conexión entre redes, entre bioregiones y entre personas, porque realmente lo que somos, somos personas que conectamos y que favorecemos nuestra capacidad de, eh, de, de, de hacer cosas, de crear juntos. Y este flujo de información lo que nos permite es tener una autoorganización, procesos de autoorganización. Entonces, la única manera es a través de la colaboración radical. Nosotros en la red global de comunidades regenerativas tenemos la conciencia plena de que no buscamos ser una red de redes de que no existe esa posibilidad porque no sería regenerativo. La única red real es el planeta completo. Entonces, lo que nosotros estamos tratando de hacer aquí es responder a eso que escuchamos. Escuchamos la necesidad de redes para financiar sus pro pro proyectos de, de, de impacto bioregional. También escuchamos la necesidad, las necesidades de las bioregiones para nutrirse de conocimientos de otras bioregiones que nos permiten eh, eh, actuar a niveles donde no tenemos experticia. Y también escuchamos las necesidades de financiadores que no tienen canales claros para poner, eh, hacer inversiones y filantropía de impacto verdadero. Y también escuchamos que esos mismos financiadores tampoco sostienen una coherencia clara entre las expectativas de la inversión y la regeneración real bioregional. Entonces estamos abriendo este espacio para juntos permitir la emergencia de algo nuevo y poderoso. Y es solamente a través de esa colaboración radical que podemos reconectar con la naturaleza para hacer simbiosis como el motor principal de la evolución en la que estamos y promover esos procesos autoorganizados que, 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 que hacen parte de los procesos naturales. Y para mostrarles, eh, para mostrarles cómo se hacen estos procesos naturales, quiero compartirles un, un pequeño video. Eh, ya lo voy a compartir acá para que screen para que podamos tener solamente un pequeño ejemplo de, de cómo funciona la naturaleza 
este ejemplo es a través del hongo mucilaginoso. Es un hongo que eh, se mueve en el bosque en el, tratando de encontrar comida. Y de repente sufre una transformación increíble de ser móvil, ameboide. De pronto, ¡pup! emerge y se autoorganiza en estructuras muy fijas, que son las estructuras que se reproducen y que producen las esporas para después germinar en algún otro momento o época del año. Ellas son individuos, amebas que van por ahí y que a partir de un momento se vuelven colectivos que se mueven juntos y que escuchan y resuenan eh, y se mueven hacia ese, esas señales de organización que se van dispersando por la comunidad. Esos son pulsos que se van incrementando en ritmo y a los que las, la, los individuos empiezan a obedecer para generar una emergencia de un orden a otra escala. Este hongo mucilaginoso, este modo mucilaginoso, se comporta entonces como una red colaborativa que se mueve por sí misma, se puede fusionar con otras. Recuerden que estos son organismos unicelulares, son células que se mueven a través de la colaboración y que cumplen funciones por afinidad. Hay unos que cumplen funciones de ser abridores de caminos en un momento y pueden cambiar en otro momento. Y el código que ellos manejan es a través del adenil monofosfato cíclico, que para nosotros es activar la metamorfosis presencial colaborativa. Ese va a ser nuestro código para lograr hacer un flujo y un intercambio de información a través de un diálogo de saberes y que a través de la colaboración radical nos lleve hacia la, ese colectivo nuevo que quiere emerger en, eh, en, los, en los territorios, en las bioregiones. Entonces necesitamos tanto los flujos de información como los flujos de recursos para que estos colectivos sean una fuerza evolutiva potente en nuestros territorios. Entonces, así es como queremos que ustedes tengan esta imagen poderosa del, de lo que es la colaboración radical y cómo se dan esos procesos de autoorganización. Entonces, mantengamos este código de activar la metamorfosis presencial colaborativa. Durante este, esta cumbre lo que queremos es empezar a aprender qué es eso, de colaborar radicalmente. Y entonces logremos escuchar profundamente e interrumpir compasionadamente, con, con compasión en nuestras conversaciones. Y esto nos va a llevar poco a poco a encontrar los ritmos de la autoorganización y de la emergencia de un nuevo orden para la regeneración bioregional. Ahora entonces le paso la palabra a Ben, quien, eh, quien nos va a hacer la introducción a lo que sigue. Thank you so much, Melina. I love looking at those images of the slime mold. Amazing and so inspiring. If, if the slime mold can do it, then surely we can and are doing it in our own way too. And maybe we just don't quite know how to see it yet. You know, I noticed a question in the chat from Killian. You know, what is it? Are we looking for a network of networks or not? And, you know, I think a network of networks exists, I think is the point, but it doesn't need to be organized from the top down by some Uber network. So the Regenerative Communities Network is not hosting this session in some position where we're saying we're somehow in charge and we're organizing bioregional regeneration for all the other networks that are also doing it. No, we show up, you know, as peers or even perhaps as, um, you know, as, as students of, of many others who've been working on this. Um, and uh, so that's really the spirit in which she was, she was talking about that. So we want to shift our focus now um, to Uh, to a little bit of participatory activity before we go to our two speakers. Um, originally, we were going to give you kind of a preview of what's going on in this summit. And, and um, we decided instead to just let things, things be perhaps a little mysterious. There's a calendar, there's all kinds of tools. We'll talk about it a little at the end and into the, the hangout that follows this plenary. So instead, we want to shift the focus back to you and ask you the question, what drew you here? 
And the invitation is to start out by just writing something in the chat about this, um, but not, um, not hitting enter. Well, you can go ahead and hit enter whenever you have something. And we'll hear a little bit of music and just slow things down and, and think about what do you hear. And then we'll move into breakouts as well, where you can continue, you can talk about this a bit for, for 10 minutes or so. And just a reminder that if you want to be in a breakout speaking Spanish, please put ES in front of your name. And uh, yeah, you might say a little more about just sort of the, the, the source, you know, what drew you here? Why are you here? What are you here for? What's calling to you? That's what we're looking for. So we'll take a few minutes here and listen to uh, Right, so we're going to move into breakouts for 10 minutes. You'll get a one minute warning after nine minutes and stay in your breakout for that final minute. And the focus here, um, well, it's, it's on this question, what drew you here? And just, it's a short breakout. So we encourage you to, um, to share the airtime. Maybe go around twice, see if you can speak for a minute each and go two times around your little circle. Um, 
with some reflections. And we'll see you back here in the main room in 10 minutes. All right. Welcome back, everyone. So we're ready to move into our speakers. And first, um, we have Helena Norberg-Hodge. And I think, Isabel, you're introducing her. Is that right? I am introducing Helena. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. So I have been lucky enough to meet Helena and have some great conversations with her, partly because I, having she started at Schumacher College, like so many of us have done, and that has really put us on the path to understanding how to work with Gaia rather than against her. And Helena has a house in the um, Totnes Dardington area, so she comes back from, from time to time. But let me introduce you I've pulled some information off her website, so I'm just going to read out this out to you. Helena is a pioneer of the new economy movement, as well as an author and filmmaker. She is the founding director of Local Futures, which is committed to the re revitalization of cultural and biological diversity and the strengthening of local communities and economies worldwide. In 1975, when she was living in Paris, she was invited to accompany a film team to the remote region of Ladakh or Little Tibet. The area had been sealed off from the outside world and had only recently been opened. Helena became the first Westerner in modern times to master the Ladakhi language and gain deep insights into the workings of one of the few cultures that remained untouched by the modern world. And Helena's always had an eye on both the local and the global. Um, this is an observation she made about the modern globalized economy. Seeing these changes across the globe, it became clear to me that many of our social and environmental problems are in fact the consequences of a global economic system which erodes local self-reliance and cultural self-respect. I started identifying the unchecked power of multinational corporations as a root cause of so much that is going wrong and calling for a vision of a conventional development and globalized policies, or she called for that revision. Uh, so in 1983, Helena founded Local Futures, which she still directs and which is still very active. And in that role, she's initiated localization movements on every continent, particularly in South Korea, Japan, the UK and Australia. She has launched both the International Alliance for Localization and World Localization Day. And she also co-founded the Global Eco Village Network. So now we're going to watch a recorded message to the summit from Helena. Yes, and I just want to note she'll she'll be with us live tomorrow as well, and I put the link in the chat so you can see when that's happening here in the plenary room, and you can find that in your local time. But here she is with a special recorded message for us. I'm extremely honored to be able to speak to you at this summit. As some of you may know, for almost half a century, I've been a proponent of localization. This happened because uh, in 1975, I was invited out to a remote part of the world called Ladakh or Little Tibet. It's a region high on the Tibetan plateau that belongs politically to India. And this region, for political reasons, had been sealed off from modern day development. But perhaps more importantly, they had not even been affected by earlier Christian missionaries or by colonialism. So this was a, a remarkable opportunity to get to know a culture that was still living in deep and, and direct contact with the resources on which people depended. It was a bioregional economy. That bioregion is what nurtured and held these people for thousands of years. It wasn't a paradise, but it was an example of what can happen when people have that opportunity to live closely enough to the resources on which they depend to know without a doubt that the health of nature the health of the water of the soil is profoundly inextricably connected to our own health. I ended up there as part of a film team. I was only going to stay a few weeks, but I fell in love 
with these people who exuded the most remarkable joie de vivre, who demonstrated a sense of humor and a vitality that was just magical. I gave up my job in Paris where I'd been working as a linguist and I proceeded to learn this ancient Tibetan dialect and in a relatively short time I managed to travel through the whole region by foot, um, it's about the size of Austria, and everywhere I went people told me we are tungbos zabos, which means we have plenty to eat, plenty to drink. I never heard a mention of hunger. I never heard anyone express anything but enthusiasm about their place, about their culture, about who they were. But speaking the language fluently, I was witness to the impact of a globalized economic system that in a very short time created a loss of self-esteem, particularly among the young, a cultural self-rejection, and with that, a rejection of farming, of the deep um, and important economy that had been the foundation of life there for thousands of years. Through modernization, people were being systematically pushed off the land into an urban center, suddenly made to compete over scarce resources. In a very short time, it led to greed, it led to violent conflict, and, uh, and of course, the destruction of the environment. What was brought in was at that time, back in the 70s, DDT and other pesticides that had been outlawed in the West. And they were being brought in by people who were often sincerely convinced that these were going to improve life on the Tibetan plateau. They had been trained into a modern agricultural worldview. They had not been given information about the fact that these chemicals were actually outlawed in other parts of the world. Anyway, this... Um, experience led to an activism that for me you know has not stopped in all these years in a, in this short time it became very obvious that we must in the west wake up to the impact that we're having on the other side of the world whether as consumers or as supporters of a what we might think of as an excellent and positive aid project bringing schools, for instance, to Nepal or to Nigeria, wherever, we might think that we're doing helpful and positive work, but we urgently need much, much deeper, broader understanding of the realities on the ground in the so-called poorer parts of the world and in the richer parts of the world where people outside of this sort of developed rich country world believe that our life is a paradise. They believe that we've reached this amazing standard of living where we don't need to work, we push a few buttons and just have a good time. So today more than ever, we need international collaboration, deep information exchange, and, and, and I'm convinced that wherever possible, we should actually encourage travel to other parts of the world for the purpose of understanding how can we today collaborate across the world to support the vital rebuilding of community, the vital rebuilding of ecological economies, that need to be bioregional to be healthy. They need to be economies that shorten the distance between production and consumption. They need to be economies where people can see the impact of what they do. The tragedy of the modern world, from my point of view, is that because we have been so separated from our impact, from our genuine footprint, on the other side of the world, 
we become victims in a system of misinformation often carried out by um, a top-down system where governments and corporations are still wedded to a notion of growth, a notion of progress that is continuing to lift us systematically away from nature, away from our local communities, away from human scale institutions where we actually again see the impact of what we do on other people and where we see the impact of institutions on our lives, whether it's an accountability, whether it's a visibility that is the prerequisite for healthier, more harmonious, more genuinely sustainable ways of living. Today, we need to be aware that the way that the climate issue has been framed, we have been duped into blaming ourselves. We have seen the rise of an environmental movement that joins in this idea that we are greedy by nature, we somehow are also not willing to change. We just want to hold on to what we have, so we're refusing to make the changes we need to make to deal with the climate issue. This is a false narrative. People have not been informed of what was happening as giant businesses that were already too big, but they moved from the industrialized rich countries to poor countries to employ cheap labor, and they managed to persuade the Western environmental movement to argue that poor countries should not need to reduce emissions as quickly as in the West or in the so-called rich countries. This narrative made a complete joke of what was actually happening. Giant, mobile corporations and banks moving across the world with freedom to exploit people and nature in a system where it's almost impossible to see your impact. Whether as a CEO or as a lowly consumer in Devon, it's very hard to know your impact. So scale is fundamental to the bioregional movement, to any movement that seeks to restore healthy ecosystems and to restore health to a very traumatized humanity today. We have been so uprooted, we have been so pitted against one another in an insanely competitive system that has been able to thrive and grow richer and richer and more powerful with the message that globalization brings us together. Globalization is creating this one village. Globalization has been the promotion, and including subsidies by our governments, to build up a global infrastructure to support everything that global corporations need to get richer. At the same time, those global corporations have bullied our governments to bring in regulations at the local level and at the national level so that every individual, small business, medium-sized business, even larger industries are being punished by heavier and heavier bureaucracy and regulation and heavy taxation, while global players generally don't pay tax and are freed from regulation. This injustice is something that needs to be discussed in any attempt to rebuild genuine, genuine health and well-being for people and the planet. We need to understand that we're operating in this system of complete injustice and manipulation. I believe it's very helpful to look at the history of this, to look at the really big picture in order to avoid blaming individuals, blaming individual corporations, blaming individual political parties, individual governments. 
this very big picture can actually be extremely empowering because more than anything, it points to the fact that humanity is not greedy and aggressive by nature. It points also to the conviction that even our leaders are blind. But where do we find vision? Where do we find activities that are genuinely supporting a turn towards health of everything that lives, towards the well-being of everything that lives? We will find it at the grassroots. It's at the grassroots because that's where people can have more knowledge, can have more experiential knowledge about what people are actually about. They move beyond labels, the, the labels that give rise to prejudice against particular groups of people, against particular cultures, or, and even prejudice against particular institutions or corporations. What happens at the local level with this experiential knowledge is that people are actually starting to rebuild local community-based initiatives that connect to the soil, to the water, to the earthworms, to the living world that supports them. This is a great message of hope, really. We at Local Futures feel so privileged to have been promoting this process of going more local, going smaller, going slower to build help. Having promoted that around the world and being in touch with about 50 language groups has given us so much hope because every day in our inbox, we get news of yet another project, yet another one that's demonstrating this path to reconnection, human scale reconnection between human beings and their ecosystem to create systems that are impervious to the machination of the dominant global system. Systems that are based on humility because humility is created when we understand the complexity the infinite complexity and diversity of the living world. We do not understand that sitting in front of a computer screen looking at labels or numbers. This is why I see ignorance growing in direct proportion to power. The higher up the ladder you go, the more dependent you are on mediated information. And as the living world turns into a label or a number, it's very easy to become extremely, extremely destructive and ignorant. So it's this revitalization of structures of connection and real experiential knowledge. That's where we're seeing a movement towards health. We're seeing a movement towards genuine prosperity. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope to be in touch with many of you and hope to work together with this very important global movement. And as you hopefully saw in the chat, we'll be graced with Helena's presence live tomorrow for a one hour conversation. Now I wanna turn it over to Melina to introduce Edward. Muchas gracias, Ben. Y qué palabras tan inspiradoras también de, de, de Helena. Ahora les vamos a, 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 le vamos a pasar la palabra a, a un muy buen amigo, Edward Mueller. Eh, Edward fue fundador y es el rector de la Universidad para la Cooperación Internacional de Costa Rica. Tiene una amplia trayectoria internacional. Él ha trabajado y realizado eh, proyectos profesionales en 40 países. Conoce el globo, ha vivido desde chiquito en muchos lugares del mundo eh, y tiene una gran experiencia en Latinoamérica. Eh, ha sido una de las personas que más ha hablado de regeneración y de desarrollo regenerativo durante mucho tiempo desde una perspectiva muy visionaria. 
eh, y es reconocido globalmente por su trabajo en desarrollo regenerativo. Está liderando ahora Costa Rica Regenerativa desde el 2018 y fue uno de los fundadores de la Red de Comunidades Regenerativas que está organizando este evento. Eh, bienvenido, Edward, y te escuchamos con, con gratitud. Thank you, Melina. Um, very inspirational, the whole process. Um, Melina asked me to kind of give insight on the question about emerging opportunities for radical collaboration. And I've thought about it, and actually I, I was thinking, yeah, there's so many opportunities there. I, I'd be able to talk for an hour, two hours, and wouldn't even start uh, scraping the, the top of it. So uh, looking back, and this is something I just set up, uh, looking back in my uh, history, I, I, I like to actually mention some of the challenges which I've identified that limit collaboration and which have to be addressed if we want to actually work together across uh, countries, regions, and so on. So I'm going to share just a few slides. Um, I'm not going to give a talk, but um, I guess you're all are familiar with the planetary boundaries approach. And basically, we are deep in the Anthropocene. That means the planetary changes that we're seeing are caused by us. What a lot of people don't realize is that climate change is not the most important one. And the whole Western world is focused on climate change. Uh, biodiversity loss is probably the most critical. Fertilizer use is very critical too. Plastic and, and chemical uh, pollution, those are the three main ones. And then we have land system change, that's land use change. We have fresh water, which is the water available for ecosystems. And then comes climate change. I'm not saying climate change is not important, but we have to try to identify which are the main causes for us leaving the planet. And I was very much involved in the CBD process. I was actually in the Nagoya uh, meetings that managed that where we elaborated this, this uh, strategic plan for biodiversity. And after 10 years, we, we basically just kicked the ball forward. Uh, none of the 193 countries have complied, and we're losing biodiversity at such an extreme that Latin America has lost 94% of its abundance. I'm not talking about species here. I'm talking about abundance of biodiversity. Uh, those of uh, you who live in Latin America, 10, 15 years ago, we'd go out with a car. We'd have to scrape the, the, the windshield from insects. Now that doesn't happen anymore. So we're we're looking at a very critical thing, and I'm not going to go into much detail here, but in terms of, of climate change, and I said it's not the most urgent one, but it is highly important and it's exponential. We are in code red and we're looking every year at new uh, processes that go beyond what we expected to see at this time of, of the evolution of the Anthropocene. And the critical thing is we have all the science. We're, we're producing so much data, so much information and so much knowledge every year. Uh, we're, we're forgetting to transform that knowledge into wisdom and transform that wisdom into action. So we need to come together around the planet and work on creating this network of networks, the mycelia to be able to turn wisdom into action. And if you just look at the definition of wisdom in Wikipedia, it's basically using this information, using the knowledge dialogues with original communities, experiential self-knowledge uh, to actually make decisions. And there's where I come across these huge challenges. And challenge number one for me is most of humanity doesn't look at nature as being themselves part of nature. And this is basically to blame on our uh, environmental education programs where we tell people you have to take care of nature. Nature take, takes care of itself. Uh, we should have been taught that without nature functioning, we don't exist. And that would be a different uh, power balance. So how do we get back to understanding that we are nature and we need to be part of nature and use nature to go forward? The other thing is, is the horrible Western education, science, uh, institutional structures, the university divided in, in departments and 
faculty not talking to each other across the board. It's this reductionist approach. Um, and it started way, way back in, the, in the, with the Greek saying, you had to look for one question, one hypothesis, and look at one answer. So the reductionist approach, the lack of system at, systems thinking and holistic approaches is an, a huge challenge. And this reductionist vision is what leads us to the wrong solutions. Uh, our decarbonization strategy in Costa Rica is focused on electric cars, which are basically cosmetic. We have a lot of other opportunities to reversing climate change just by using the soil and life in the soil. And another example is, okay, we have to get rid of the cows to save the planet. And actually, cattle ecosystems are some of the most effective ecosystems when they're well managed on uh, putting carbon under our feet. The other question is exponential changes. We're taught to think linearly. And what we're seeing now is exponential change. And we're not used to thinking of, yeah, this year it's one, next year it's two, the year after it's four, then eight, 16, 32, 64. And we're still thinking we still have another 50 years to solve these issues. Biodiversity loss is exponential. Uh, technology development is exponential. Challenge four, wide acceptance of wrong methods. So how do we still believe in GDP? How do we still believe in chemical agriculture when we know all the damage is done? Um, and challenge five, and this is basically the last one, uh, because it is so critical to be able to unlearn. We've been taught from famous universities the wrong things. We've been taught through our evolution process the wrong thing. So we need to really be able to unlearn. And that is where we need to come together and work together with examples. And there are many, many tools we are using, for example, the donut. Here I can identify in Costa Rica which are our biggest challenges and focus on solving these challenges as a, as a priority. Now, this donut will be different in different countries. So we want to collaborate across regions. We still need to look at what affects one bioregion, which, which are the common things, where can we look for joint solutions, and where it's complementary according to differences. So we can actually work on reverting these planetary boundaries and reducing our social inequality in the case of Costa Rica to look for a good donut. And that's where all this collaboration comes together. And finally, my last slide is for us, regenerative development or regeneration is basically taking Mother Earth as the basis of all. I mean, that Mother Earth, functional bioecosystem, functional landscapes and seascapes is the basis for life. On the other extreme of this toroid is basically spirituality. So that's our deep um, concerns, our, convi our, our, our being convinced, uh, having compassion, being mindful, and generating an internal change and a community change, collectivizing this change. And then we have the four other dimensions. And how do we integrate this into a holistic approach? The only way I found possible to do this was on a bioregion. So basically putting these layers one on top of the other and working through the layers, not within the layers, not within a discipline, but across. So you get people to work on one problem in a bioregion from different fields, different backgrounds, and look for joint solutions. So with that, what I'm saying is we need to really, one, we need to move beyond pilot projects. We have hundreds and thousands of pilot projects. Many of them are looking at their own belly button. They, they don't even, I, I see so many of these beautiful examples of success in regeneration, and then the neighbors, have no clue what's happening in there. Uh, they have not been able to spread it out to their community. Um, so scaling is so important. Scaling is, is, is critical. We need to scale. And what is the, there's more and more money becoming available for re regeneration. We'll try to find regenerators to hire. And I'm not talking only about agriculture. I'm talking about tourism. I'm talking about economics. I'm talking about culture, even spirituality. So where are you going to get these um, experts in regeneration or these people that know how to do regeneration to develop the amount of programs we, we need to launch over the next three, four years, five years to be able to uh, reverse the planetary damage and survive beyond the end of this decade. So I'll just leave it there. Uh, one of the things that guides me a lot is Bucky Fuller's principle of not let's not fight the system. That, that's a waste of time. Let's just build a better system. These bioregions have to be good systems 
that make the old systems obsolete in terms of governance, in terms of urban development, in terms of relationships between uh, the different communities. So let's just come together and, and create solutions, co-create solutions across the board based on principles. And you can take whatever you want, but let's not criticize and, and bring it down. Let's just bring it up. And that would be my, my comment for today. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Edward, for your inspirational words and your inspirational work and your wrestling with the complexity of the challenges and the opportunities. I do want to hear about the opportunities, too, and I know you're going to be involved in a number of sessions over the next two weeks. You can just in the calendar, you can just um, search on Edward and you'll you know that name and you'll find those sessions, I think. Um, and we'll talk more about the tools and the platforms um, in, the, in the beginning of the Hangout that's coming up. So I just want to check in briefly with my co-conveners here. Given that we're coming to the end of the, the 90 minutes that this is scheduled for, I'm inclined to say we just you know keep going with our flow. If people have to leave, we say good night to them or good day, whatever the, the timing is. But that uh, what we have planned next is another short breakout for 10 minutes. And... Um, Unless, Isabella or Melina, you think we should just skip that. I think we should stay with it um, and, uh, and just stay here as, as, long as, we, uh, as long as we need to. And someone's calling me, I'm ignoring that. Um, so I'm not hearing any objections. So 10 minutes now with, with this question. What struck you about what you just heard from Edward and Helena? So this is not an opportunity. It's not an invitation for you to network and talk a lot about yourself and what you're doing. We have two weeks to do that and lots of spaces where that's explicitly invited, including the Hangouts. Um, but here we really want to focus on digesting together. Remember in the beginning, now our minds are one. Can we try for 10 minutes to do that um, in some way? What is what is emerging from, from the wisdom of these two wayfinders, people who have been asking these questions and exploring things practically and theoretically on the ground and, and globally in dialogue for many, many years. Um, so we'll spend 10 minutes that way. I've set up the groups again. Uh, once again, I um, think they should be shuffled a little bit. Let me just move a couple of things around because it looks like some people have, have perhaps dropped off at this point. Uh, uh, so we'll just get the groups to be a little bigger, but you can also move. Um, if you need to. Uh, so I think, yeah, we have a group of, let's merge these two people. All right, so we have threes and fours. And um, again, you can move if you need to. And we'll, we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for staying a little bit beyond this scheduled time for the call. You know, we have to say goodbye to uh, Isabel, who's going to join her family. Or is she already, she's still here to say goodbye? I don't see her. I think she may have dropped off already. <laughs> um, so perhaps we'll just, um, you know, we, we, we plan to just flow into an hour of, of, of hangout sessions. So we're, uh, we're 10 minutes into that already. We had some thoughts uh, for various things we might do before that in terms of an orientation to the, the tools and platforms and a bit of a preview to things. Um, the Hangouts are primarily things that happen in breakouts. In the main room, we do talk about uh, the infrastructure of the, um, I'm getting noise from someone here, so there we go. Um, the infrastructure of the summit, any questions you have about how this works? So I think I think what we'll do, um, curious if this sounds right to you, Melina, is just kind of flow into that. We won't worry about the musical interlude in between, uh, which normally with the Hangouts we will do, we'll start them with music and some silent non-spoken connecting before we open the breakouts uh, and, and the, the main room. Yeah, what do you think, Melina? Sí, perfecto. Creo que creo que solamente para completar, eh, digamos que damos por terminada la sesión de 
eh, de la plenaria de apertura. Eh, fue muy bonito estar con ustedes en este proceso, tanto por la mañana como, como esta tarde. Y los que queramos quedarnos a tanto resolver problemas y preguntar un poco cómo funciona y conocer un poco cómo funciona la, la plataforma, pues nos podemos quedar. Y los que queramos también tener conversaciones en otros, eh, en otros espacios, en breakout rooms, podemos, podemos también quedarnos y seguir la conversación. Eh, eh, y de eso se tratan estos hangouts, estos recreos, ¿no? Entonces... Eh, pues muchísimas gracias a todos por estar y, y bueno, ven, tu turno. Yeah, I think maybe, yeah, maybe just one thing I want to share with you before we go, which is kind of how you can find everything else. Um, so in addition to coming to other hangouts for live support, uh, let me just show you this. So you, I think you've all gotten here through the Kiko Chat platform and we're really grateful to Kiko Chat for all the support they've given us. Uh, to set this up. When you come in, you're in the main room here and you see the screen. There are all these tabs up here. So there are many different resources that we've created. Some of them have just been added today. They're different in some of the different rooms where the various sessions happen. So one important thing is to note that you want to look on the calendar for other sessions. Just click on them and you'll see where it's happening. So many things do happen here in the main room where you are, but many things happen in these nature rooms and you have to go click on that and then join video for that particular room. And inside of them, you may see some different things. And we, we have harvesting, a, a special harvest document for each room, for example. But one thing I want to show you is there's this summit help button as well. And so there's all kinds of information here in English and in Spanish. There are links to videos that explain the calendar and the map and all these other things. So if you're willing to put a little bit of time in to learning all the different aspects of this, there's material there for you. You don't have to take advantage of everything we have. Showing up and, and just using the space in the way that feels best and right to you is the most important thing. I think we've gotten a good start here. Uh, we've stirred things up in many ways. And now we have two weeks of all kinds of things to continue working the soil and planting seeds. And then when we're done with the closing plenaries of Friday the 4th, we're still not done. We're just getting started. And all these tools and platforms that we have, they can live on, they can support more work, um, and we can explore and, and really manifest the opportunities that were gathered here uh, in, in service to and, and that are inspiring us. So with that, I'm going to declare the plenary officially closed. Stop the recording. Maybe everyone wants to just unmute and say, you know, whatever you want to say just quickly we'll make a big noise and we'll stop the recording <laughs> thank you ben thank you so much uh, and thank you everyone thank you. yo quiero thank agradecer you. a nuestro traductor que estuvo Bye. todo el tiempo Very excited aquí for the next two weeks. thanks for the translator who helped us to yes, make it Andres. available for the for the spanish, spanish speakers gracias andres mm -hmm.